Hello, um, thank you for coming to the LGBTQ Voices panel. Um, my name is Kathleen Duffy. I'm a PhD student at Northwestern University where I study religion in the United States. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off here, uh, but Milan and Etta will be speaking after that and then we'll enter a little conversation together before um, engaging with all of you. So I'm really excited um, and I'll just go ahead and jump into it. Um, so like I said, I'm a student at Northwestern University, um, getting my PhD in religious studies. But today I'm gonna to talk to you a little, bit of, a little bit about a podcast project I'm developing called Through My Fault, um, which is a four part limited series. Um, and in it, I use stories from my own past and upbringing within the space of a Catholic youth group to explore the surveillance of bodies and the performance of suffering in those spaces. Um, and how they come to shape queer youth and their experience. Um, and I really want to immerse you all in it a bit uh, to help you understand kind of the intentions of the project and my aims. So I'm gonna play you a two minute clip. Um, this excerpt that you'll hear comes from the pilot episode, which focuses very intimately on my relationship with a girl named Mel, who I would now call my high school girlfriend. Um, though we never would have used that language at the time. Um, we met at our Catholic youth group and that was really the setting where our relationship unfolded. Uh, when I reached out to her for the sake of this podcast, it was actually the first time we had spoken since high school. Um, so in this clip, you will hear us grapple with how to define our relationship for the first time ever, um, followed by some narrated reflection. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share that with you now. How would you define our relationship at the time? Really tricky and really complicated. It was difficult to navigate because like when it was just us, we were in our own world. And then when we left our space, we not only had to act different, but uh, present different, right? And I don't know why. Probably because we knew that like, we wouldn't be allowed to hang out as much, right, in, in the youth group setting anymore. Do you think other people knew? Oh, yeah. But I don't think, I think they thought it was even more than it actually was. You know what I mean? Like, we for sure were, a, like, a thing, but we didn't, I don't know, I didn't, it's weird to say, like, did you comprehend that we were actually a, a thing when it was happening? No. Me either. So like, for other people to see it, but us not see it is a very strange, not only thing to say, but like, it's hard to understand. For me, I think it, it felt like, oh, like, I can't make this, I can't make this real. Um, like, I can't actually, it, it, because they're so concerned about it being yeah. real, it can't be, it can't be real. I relate to that. As much as Sunday Night Youth Group and Spring Retreat was our time, it was still God's time too. I still remember the feeling of being there. I remember crying after taking the Eucharist because I could really feel Jesus. He was as real to me as Mel's hand was, whether we were holding them under the table in secret or holding them up with everyone else, our eyes closed tight while we sang the Our Father. I just didn't know how to let both of those things be real at the same time. Eventually, Mel and I let each other go. Um, okay, so the story goes on um, and together we process not only our past relationship as we do here, but also the narratives of guilt and shame that we've carried since then and begin to unpack that together. Um, and I chose this clip because uh, I think it does a good job of showing the belief I have in this medium, right? How podcasting is uniquely suited to telling queer stories on the one hand, right? It literally makes space for our voices, even as the podcast shows when it's really messy and we're still trying to find the right words and 
in that process of grappling with one another. Um, and that's something I really wanted to embrace with this project. But I also believe that this medium has a unique capacity to queer the boundaries of scholarship. So I did not want this to be a didactic conversation between two scholars. Um, I wanted it to be a story that was very much defined by relationship. And I extend that to the relationship between the story and the listener. So by immersing listeners in the story, in sound and story, rather than explanations, the listener is invited to participate through their own interpretive work, to think about right, the silences and the intimacy and distance of a phone call and that crackly sound, um, the sounds of youth worship music and liturgy as a backdrop, and how that all comes to bear on the narrative itself. Um, so uh, this isn't argumentative prose, but it is knowledge production um, and a particular valuable form of that, I think. Um, so that is about the time that I have uh, right now, but I look forward to speaking more about some of these themes um, with my fellow panelists and all of you. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Milan now. Thank you. Um, so my name is Milan Talunen. Um, I am now a postdoc at MIT, um, but until this summer, I was doing a PhD um, at Columbia in comparative literature. Um, so I want to talk about a podcast project that is still in progress um, uh, called Speaking of Spirituality. Um, and this is a project that has been, well, it, it's had various um, forms and visions over the years. So um, I'm going to focus on kind of what it is now. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, it has developed a lot over, over time. Um, I'd be happy to talk about some of the earlier phases. Um, so Speaking of Spirituality um, is a hybrid podcast sound art project that is um, focusing on uh, local churches in Harlem, New York. Um, so local to me at Columbia University um, and um, focusing on their histories of queer affirming feminist and anti-racist activism uh, and also the theology that underpins that activism for those churches. Um, and so the, uh, the, the end result is going to be three episodes um, focused on three different churches. Each one features a uh, representative of that church um, typically like the pastor of the church um, in conversation with me, um, but a large proportion of the episode will also be original music composed by a uh, sound artist um, who is um, a queer Black man um, and also a former Catholic. Um, and um, so it's a kind of combination of the voices of this, the pastors of these churches um, with originally composed music, and then also a lot of work with kind of uh, ambient noise and spatial audio um, and um, recordings that, that um, we've made within the spaces. Um, and so I want to play you just a bit of one of the speakers. Um, we haven't yet combined the music and the speech, um, but uh, so I want to play you just a bit of a clip from uh, one of those episodes. Um, and let me get that going. So to give you the context, so this is um, the speaker is Reverend Derek McQueen, the first ever um, openly gay Black Presbyterian pastor um, and the pastor of a very noteworthy church in Harlem called St. James Presbyterian. Um, and at the point that I'm going to play this audio, we've already had a conversation about um, his uh, reimagining of what grace might mean in a theological context. And, um, well, I, I won't go into too much detail. Um, there's a lot to say there, but so, um, he's now going to move on to talking about kind of grace in a more personal sense for him. Uh, so here we go. This nine foot baby foot grand piano that you oh, see yeah. here yeah, yeah, yeah. was a gift to Dorothy Maynard, the husband, the, the wife of the woman who started the Harlem School of the Arts, who was an opera singer a concert singer, so you know music was really important to her. Mm -hmm. This, we take care of this piano 
very well. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 70 years old now. But it is just something about hearing the music from this piano mm -hmm. and singing with it. There's something about it that lets you know that there is this grace. Mm -hmm. And that, that flows through this space, which is why I mentioned the sound before. Yeah. Music enables you yeah. to say without saying, and you feel it. You just feel it because of the music. And but there's so much great music in the church. It's whether it's classical, whether it's jazz, whether it's yeah. blues or gospel. It's all. It's all an effective way to bring grace alive mm. as a, as a spirit. It's almost like a spirit that goes through people. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know whether you've experienced some of that feeling of grace through music outside of a church, like in other contexts that are not religious. And thinking about like, you know, listeners who maybe don't attend church, mm -hmm. but they have a relationship with music, you know, that this is resonating with them, but it might not be religious. You remember the story I told you when we first met about the, the, mu the way music moves people in their spirit. Yeah. And on one of my birthdays, my friends took me out to a club. Uh -huh. And we went to this gay club in the 30s, and it was a jam-packed night. Mm -hmm. And around 1 o'clock in the morning, the music shifted. And all of a sudden, everybody was up on the dance floor. We went out, we started dancing. And I was like, why am I singing the lyrics to these songs? Yeah. And we were, it was all gospel music. Yeah. And people were on the floor dancing and singing because it was their church. Yeah. It was so I will stop there um, and hand over to Edda. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Edda Yuka, and I'm also a graduate student at Northwestern University. Unlike my esteemed colleagues, I'm drawing my reflections not from podcasts, as I haven't made my podcast yet, but from encouraging my students to make their own podcasts as part of their final projects for my course, Religion in the Digital Age, which I taught at Northwestern during winter quarter 2022. So I'm going to start by telling you a bit about my course and student learning outcomes and then open the panel dialogue and all participants dialogue, which is really the heart of what we're here to do today is to talk to one another. So in Religion in the Digital Age, we considered how religious and spiritual but not religious digital natives and adopters are reimagining religious presences, mediation, ethics, and ontology to challenge established religious authority, create community, innovate devotional practices, and theorize their experiences. Students practice skills for digital humanities research, engaged in ethical reflection, and applied course learning to creating their own digital artifacts, such as podcasts, which they released into their own digital milieus as acts of care for their own digital communities. My objective for this course was threefold. First, to demonstrate the relevance of religious studies, which is my thing, to the analysis of weird and wondrous digital trends and artifacts and phenomena, which was really more their thing, you know, avatar baptisms and emoji spells and the like. Second, for students to begin to recognize through lines apart from which ostensibly unrelated hypercurrent digital events would not have materialized and congealed into something like a digital age. And there was tremendous parody in this exchange. So we discussed, you know, the problem of TikTokers claiming to jump parallel universes to where Harry Potter is real and happens to be a close friend. And we also discussed the Orientalist roots of the phenomenologically and ontologically disturbing practice of tulpamancy. Um, undergirding this rather unwieldy agenda was a third objective, which was structuring from below uh, a queer reconsideration of the twin affective pillars of contemporary social justice in the digital age, anger at unjust systems and perpetrators of injustice and care for activists and survivors of injustice. These affective pillars set, of course, by the foundational works of Audre Lorde and the uses of anger 1981 and a burst of light 1988 reconsidered now for the digital age by queer activists and scholars grappling with the problem of a certain brand of dogmatic sacrificial leftism outlined in Yarrow Edie's canonical Everything is Problematic 1994 and picked up by now by queer activists and public intellectuals such as Sarah Shulman, Kai Chen Tom, Adrian Marie Brown, Natalie Wynn, among others. 
the positive backdrop of this critique was an invitation to recenter something more than the exigencies of the present in our digital labor. A deeper tradition of queer intimacy, community making, and love. It was out of this deeper, urgent tradition that I invited my students to consider how they might contribute to a healthier culture of digital exchange. And it was in this context that two of my students, two gamer boys, created their own podcasts as gifts for their Discord communities. The first student interviewed Discord members to engage for the first time questions of how their gaming community served as a much needed lifeline during the COVID pandemic. The second produced a podcast defending digital community as real community and reflecting on the questions of what made for good friendship and how to protect it in a time of rising digital harassment and recruitment and radicalization online. Gifting these digital artifacts to their own communities demonstrated how we might use podcasting to queer the boundaries of the classroom as queer affective and um, ethical reconsiderations of anger and care demonstrated how much queer workers have to offer digital humanities writ large. So those are my reflections on um, using podcasting in my course. So I think where I'd like to start the dialogue with Milan and Kathleen is to ask you um, how you situate your podcasting in and out of academic labor. What kind of space does podcasting give you to do different kinds of work than you're doing otherwise? And can you expand on how it's allowed you to facilitate um, the kinds of human connections that might be rare in academic labor? Yeah, I can go ahead and start us off. Um, I began this project actually not as my primary research, um, which focuses a lot on religion and the act of like nation making um, and, you know, the environment. Uh, and I really pursued this as, um, you know, I've long thought about what does it mean to make different kinds of scholarship um, and who is included and excluded by like the nature of this like media of the me different mediums that we engage. Um, and so that's what led me there. But the project itself um, was something that I did like largely for fun, right? Um, for fun, reinvigorating like life and value into what can often uh, be like a really exhausting and degrading environment, right? Like it's hard to be in academia. And I wanted to remember why I came here and what it is to learn and to learn and to push boundaries in new and different ways. Um, and what's been so valuable, right, is that I'm learning these skills through a pr project that like, I, I don't plan to, you know, this won't be my life's work, this particular project, but it's a skill set that I hope to bring into the work, right, that is immediate and immediately being evaluated, right, by uh, professors and, you know, various people that I have to like, you know, prove my scholarship to. Um, and, but it's been so lovely because the, I am still taking this, right? It still is coming into places like, um, you know, spaces that are normally used to evaluate writing um, have now let me bring in this podcast as like an item for discussion and of critical discussion and of, in that sense, right, expanding um, the vocabularies of other, you know, academics. Um, so how can they talk about work? How are they also learning this new grammar of, of um, of scholarship, um, in addition, right, to like all of the, the wonderful relationships that I've been able to rekindle um, as an individual through this project. Um, well, I mean, I would say the first question about sort of like, how does it connect to my academic work? Um, the answer is like, it hasn't really that much. Um, it's been alongside it and, you know, competing for time and energy. And so that has been a challenge, um, but one I've been, you know, happy to 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 invest time and energy in. Um, but I, I I love the question about the facilitating the connections that wouldn't be possible within academia. I think for me, as someone who's not a churchgoer, I've just had like this project has allowed me to form these relationships with 
amazing people at these churches who I would never, never otherwise have met or spoken with. Um, and I think, I don't think this is unique to churches or, you know, like houses of worship, religious institutions. But one thing that I was just really struck by is how much they are, you know, intellectual communities, communities of thought, communities of interpretation, uh, things that sometimes I think in the humanities at universities, we feel like we have a kind of monopoly over and we certainly don't. Um, and in fact, I thought it was really kind of like refreshing to me and and wonderful just to see how kind of engaged in the world um, these these pastors at these churches are, you know, like discussions of like queer theory, fem feminist theory um, within university spaces can be very academic. Um, and, you know, with these pastors, it's like, they have people in their own congregations that have these urgent issues that they want, you know, guidance on, advice on, you know, support in reflecting on. And um, yeah, so I, I found that just like really, um, you know, these these ideas that can seem very detached from the world, um, seeing them seeing them in use, I think was really wonderful to me. Um, and also, I don't know, can I throw the question back to you, Edda, like, you know, working with these students, did that also kind of connect you to some of these like gamer communities that you wouldn't otherwise have insights into? Like, what was that like for you? Yeah, totally. I think one of my students texted me the other day, this is like an ex-student, and was like, Edda, you need to, I think it was like Mortal Kombat something. So I get like video game recommendations now that I wouldn't otherwise get. And they like, they notice connections to my work on the American Orient and that. So that's really good. And they really pushed back at me because, you know, I am like definitely a digital adopter, you know? So they pushed back on my own suspicion and my own bias in terms of the kinds of communities that we can build online and the health of these communities. Um, but I'd say along with that, what I've loved about doing this work with them is that it's allowed us to engage academic labor with an open-endedness and an invitation to mystery that's necessarily real for queer life, but rare in standard thesis and data-driven academic writing. So they could try things that might flop, basically, and that was okay. Another a question that is coming up for me, um, or I guess a sort of a theme that I know we've already noted is just the sort of um, all three of us, there's something about the kind of like the smallness of the communities that we are working with. Um, and, um, you know, I want to credit Stacey Copeland, who's here for really sparking my thinking on that topic. Um, so I hope you will also speak to this later on. But um, I just wanted to invite um, the two of you, Ada and Kathleen, to just talk a bit more about kind of, you know, maybe the relationship between these like you know, small communities that are not necessarily like public and like podcasts that are not necessarily targeting the entire world, how that relates to queerness in particular. Yeah, I, I think for me, um, what I value about the smallness is the way that it invites intimacy. And I think that's something that I'm hearing with like, Etta, when you describe right, the like these gamer communities, right? Like they are like, they are so intimate. Um, and because of that intimacy though right like you get this like this this gorgeous picture from it right that you are able to like understand all of these nuances and that ambiguity that that mystery right that at a um you know invoked is doesn't become something that's just confusing right it instead is like this place of learning right um which is so different from like I feel like typical academic writing where something's just confusing it's like oh I just don't get it um and instead now it's like oh, there's something about this that is very human, that is very compelling. Um, and it's that particularity that then makes it accessible. Um, and it's something that I valued so much about this process. I, I'm in that moment of bursting with so many thoughts that I can't actually organize what I'm thinking. Um, 
But I will say that something that comes out of, you know, my own background in, in church spaces, like the ones that you describe, Milan, in those like small queer communities and dialogues of like, what was that? What did we do that Kathleen, you described? Um, to bring that gift of like smallness and of not not producing for for mass consumption of like feeling okay presenting things that are unfinished which has become so scary in an you know in an age of hyper vigilance of like digital ethical hyper vigilance to be able to ask um questions from where you're actually at I guess that's what I would reflect just inviting my students to feel comfortable being unfinished and like there's real value in creating for our small communities well it's 1 p.m eastern should we open it up to yeah. everyone so I think we have some sort of questions uh, prepared just to kind of start the discussion off. Um, do you have yeah. those ready to go? I do. I'll go ahead and drop those in the chat um, so everyone has them. Go. All right. There are some questions. Um, I can also screen share. I don't know if that's helpful or if that makes it hard because we can't see each other. Um, if there are preferences here. I think this is fine, but maybe can we read them out just so that, um, yeah. I don't... Yeah, absolutely. Some time to verbally process, absolutely. Um, so question one, uh, making and enjoying podcasts is often thought of as a solitary activity, yet we all found podcasting as a means of reconnecting, creating and sustaining community. How have you found <clears throat> podcasting as a means of disconnecting from and connecting to others, um, such as unlikely interlocutors, old selves and friends, audience participants, parasocial relationships, and or the question of the real community. Um, Shall I read the second one? Oh, you, <laughs> you go. Podcasting is often thought of as being a digital medium out of space, yet we found podcasting a spacious and space-making means of being queer in the academy. How have you found space and spaciousness through podcasting? And then the third question, does LGBTQ plus podcasting have any particular affect, ethic, or agenda? How does queerness inform your approach to podcasting? Basha. Hi, sorry, my camera is not working. I'm going to sort it out in a moment. Um, uh, I am so, so intrigued by, I think it's the last question, but also Kathleen, what you were saying that it, podcasting is a way for querying academic discourse. And what I loved about that was you're not only talking about content, but format as well, right? Like how do we queer um, innovate uh, you know, um, academic discourse through this? Okay, so what are your like imaginations in that regard? So for example, do you know, like we write these um, very, uh, uh, we have been writing these like very, uh, I am using air quotes to say academic journal articles and these books. But if you could push for querying these formats, what would uh, a podcasting journal look like, for example? Would it be podcast episodes with reflections? Um, what would these things be? I'm just curious to know because I'm so excited about this uh, pushing back on the format as well. Yeah, um, I have some initial ideas. Um, well, initial ideas in the sense that I think it could be a lot of things, right? There are a lot of kinds of podcasts out there in the world. You know, there are the two-person discussions. There are 
podcasts that blur fact and fiction. Um, and I don't know if I, I'm excited to hear what all of you have uh, to say about what it could what it could look like. Um, because yeah, just because there are so many and that part of what it necessitates, right, is just a new way of talking and thinking about about what's, what it's doing, right? I think that people don't, they listen and they listen, as you said, for content rather than for medium, right? So it's this whole kind of reorienting ourselves um, to, think, to think so intimately about like, what does a sound do, right? How does it affect, um, how does it affect an argument, a story um, or, or so on? Um, and also interesting questions too about, right? Like uh, what, what standards we have, right? For evaluation. Um, in terms of like having second readers for different articles and things. So what that process looks like um, and what kind of a hub that would be, what kind of different community it would facilitate. Um, those are some initial thoughts I have. Um, I, so my thoughts, I think I'm thinking about sort of, you know, I really agree with what's been said about the sort of you know the the value of kind of like the unfinished um quality of of these conversations um uh you know and and just kind of querying calling into question the sort of academic norms of of writing and of speaking um but what i want to add to that is just that you know these sort of like unfinished um or less sort of like polished conversations actually a ton of work can go into achieving that and that I think, um, you know, just thinking about my own experience with this project, like the audio that that I played, right? Like there's a certain kind of like intimacy to that relationship. That's partly because I had spent many, many hours with Derek McQueen before that and with other people around as well, having other conversations, you know, that allowed that conversation then to feel very kind of natural and intimate and so on. Um, so... Yeah, I think kind of also being aware of the kind of like, you know, if you want to call it labor or just like time and energy, like all of the work that um, goes into uh, these these kinds of, um, you know, things that seem to break with the academic norms, but it's not a break that is about being lazy or, you know, um, taking an easier option. Thank you. That's really exciting. And also, I love the unfinishedness of it because that in academia is so lacking, right? Like, rather than presenting yourself as the ultimate authority on everything, it's really nice to have that unfinished quality where you can contribute to conversations um, uh, if it's unfinished. And I, I love that. Um, but I, I, I absolutely agree with you that the labor of the unfinished has to be recognized. Thank you. Actually, can I add something, which is just the sort of, I think the value of like thinking out loud, right? Like the sort of like unfinished thinking, like hearing thinking in process. I think that is something I really value. And I think, I feel like what Edda, when we've talked before, that's also something that, you know, you work with, with your students, that sort of deep anxiety that people can feel, especially in the sort of like social media age of like well if I think out loud and I sort of like get something wrong along the way my life could be over um so maybe do you want to speak a little bit about that and sort of how you help students to deal with that fear I I would just underline that absolutely my student there has been a chilling effect of that culture online and my students are very fearful of hurting others and experiencing social death and um you know, I just really try to encourage them that this is a learning space. <laughs> it's what we're here for. Um, so yeah, I underline everything that's been said. I'd love to hear from others as well. Tyler. Hi there. So again, thank you for the presentation. Those were all fascinating. I really enjoyed how all of you engage with religious themes to some degree in your work. That's like a really interesting through line. I'm a queer person who was 
raised in the evangelical Fundy Light Church. I now study surveillance of the queer body now. And I just, I love that that's such a community building thing for all of us is that kind of shared, sometimes little T, sometimes big T trauma, but that is a really interesting experience. Um, I primarily work with electronic literature, not podcasting, um, but I think there's something still about the digital that allows us to marry those very, very personal experiences with also academic engagement with these topics in a way that a traditional academic format doesn't allow for, where you're having to be quite objective, even in a humanities field, you're still having to be quite objective with your analysis, where this allows for more of the not always the author or the speaker or the writer, but someone who is injecting that academic engagement with something very personal and connecting to a very niche community. And that's just something I see across electronic literature, podcasting, et cetera. Just something about the digital format allows for that multimedia engagement with these things. Sorry, my um, <laughs> my Amazon in the wall is talking, but... Um, yeah, I just, I, I find that really fascinating as someone who doesn't primarily work with podcasting, but is seeing a lot of through lines with just digital media, multimedia in general. I love your second question about space. That's something that I think a lot about. Um, and maybe this isn't the same way that you meant the question, but just the the space that it requires to record a podcast or to be able to listen to a podcast and the privilege, like the literal space as a resource that is a privilege that some people have more of or less of. And I don't know exactly where to go with those thoughts, but how that can dovetail with like uh, representation and like who has access and who who's given space and space and time is intertwined too. So oh, big, these are big thoughts. I don't necessarily have anything super useful other than cool question. And I think it's very worthwhile to think more about that. So thank you for bringing it up. And <laughs> If anyone else wants to like talk about those things in maybe more concrete ways, maybe you all can help me yeah refine my well, my spacious thoughts i think one of the things that your comment reminds me of is that the siege of this project was just thinking about um how the kind of norm for podcast audio is just this despatialized audio right where you are not aware where it was recorded like as a listener you can't tell it's supposed to be kind of clean and just noticing how much time and effort um, my podcasting partner and I had spent on a previous project, kind of removing all of those clues to where it had been recorded. And we were like, well, what if we make the space in which it's recorded the central feature? And that led us to churches and then to this project. Um, so, you know, that I, I, I think the sort of like the wear of the recording and also the wear of the listening um, can be really powerful and that they can touch on these questions of kind of privilege and, and access, right? Like we were very aware of the privilege of being invited into these church spaces. And I will say we approached other churches who were not open to us coming and having conversations in their spaces. So the very existence of these conversations recorded there um, speaks to that those questions of kind of privilege and access. Yeah, that's awesome to bring the local, like the material, physical space, and to record that. Uh, something came up in a panel yesterday about like there's so many podcasts, and I'm trying to choose which ones to assign in my future classes. And that was a, a piece of advice someone offered is like, think about your place, your local region, what's the land and the stories of that land, and like who who's taking ownership and like representing that locality. So that's a cool overlap as well. Uh, awesome. I just unmute.
Hi, uh, thanks for this conversation so far. It's lovely. Um, as Milan knows, I don't know if other people I've interacted with or not, I lose track of who I interact with in these Zoom spaces sometimes. Um, but it was re just really lovely to hear about other people thinking about queerness and podcasting, because I'm sure as all of you know, sometimes it can feel a bit lonely when you're in other spaces, academic spaces. Um, so I was really interested in also well, the whole conversation in general, but the space conversation that's been happening right now. Um, and thinking about, Amelia, you brought up kind of like the question of privilege as an energy saving device that Sarah Ahmed talks about a lot and how that kind of goes back into who gets to use space, physical space to make podcasts, who has the time and actual literal energy to make those things. Uh, and bring them into the academic space because pushing back against traditional norms of writing and publication takes a lot of energy and sometimes that means uh, folks with privilege end up being the ones doing that first um, but then how do we make space as well as give energy to others to also enter those spaces and have space uh, so that got me thinking more about that which was lovely so thank you for your comments um, and then I, I was also curious to hear more from Ida you had talked about your students making podcasts as acts of care for their community. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit for me, because I think a lot about care work uh, in my podcasting work as well, and thinking about how that relates back to like the methods and ethical choices before we even start making a podcast, for instance. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know what else to say. I think you know, it comes, I, I come to my academic work as a second career. Um, and in my, in my earlier work, everything that I produced, everything that I wrote was for a, le a real live shared ethical community. Like I was writing for people and I was writing as an act of care. So I have this real question of like, what is our academic labor for? Um, and I can only say that for these, for some of these students, it was a really like, you know, one of my students said that in order to make this project, he had to start to rethink of himself as somebody who can, who could care for other people, who could create something that might care for other people, and that he had to lean on my faith and his ability to care for other people as he worked through that process, and that that was really transformative for him. So I don't know if that was an answer, but it's something that I'm still reflecting on and how um, how valuable it was to, you know, my students are not, unfortunately, hardened leftists like I am. Some of them are coming from like Trump country and stuff. So, um, so the gift of inviting them into this social justice work with this grounding of care, I think, is inestimable, you know, like for them to experience my love and care in the context of being invited to that work, I think was um, really important. So that was just rambling, but hopefully some of that was generative. And I wonder for others, if you think of yourselves as, as carers, as people whose, whose work is an act of care. I don't know that I have in the past, but I kind of want to now <laughs> uh, because it does does seem like a really useful and just healthy and nurturing and awesome way to think about it. My research and work is like podcasts should have transcripts. That's my <laughs> my big uh, crusade, and it it definitely would like was spawned by my own personal like I like it when there's a transcript. It's my own like a thing that I care about, but there is some care for like inclusivity and access, usability, all those things that could be framed as, um, yeah, creating a transcript is an act of care. So me advocating and trying to find ways to make it easier for that future to be more real could 
could be framed as, yeah, I, I'm trying to make everyone more caring for everyone. I don't know if that, that seems silly or not, but I like that. So thank you. And I, I don't know if that little example is helpful to anyone else either, but. Yeah, that's perfect. It's really concrete. I love it. Yeah. I mean, so one thing I'm, I'm thinking about now is like, uh, so the backstory of this project, like there was a, a more ambitious version of it um, that turned out to not be feasible, but where we were going to invite participants to come and walk around the churches, listen to the audio, and then s record a response into their smartphone and upload it to us. Um, and um, what, you know, what we were excited about then, um, or one of the things we were excited about was that it, we would, well, our idea was we would specifically um, promote this to kind of two groups of participants. One would be the members of those three churches. The other would be queer people in New York City with an interest in spirituality, um, you know, whether or not they are churchgoers as well. And then one of the things that then seemed kind of potentially kind of promising to us was that people who, queer people who have not felt welcome in church spaces um, would have not only like a reason to go into a couple of church spaces, but also a sense of, um, you know, their contribution to a conversation being valued. Um, and, you know, anyway, for, for logistical reasons that has turned out to not really be feasible, but I think um, that idea of sort of involving people um, as an act of care while also wanting to be kind of careful about, you know, when people are being brought into these spaces where they've historically not felt welcome, how do we make sure that they do feel welcome and safe? And, um, you know, anyway, those are, that's a bit of a ramble, but um, yeah, I'm also not used to thinking about my work as care, but um, yeah, I, uh... oh, thanks, Stacy. Anyway, yes, so over to someone else. Do you mind if I interject here? Because it's a really interesting conversation and I've been like, kind of um, like, I guess like I wanted to interject around the word care in particular because I really appreciate like all of the ethics and like aesthetics and affects. I guess that was like a formulation someone used earlier that go that are like around care. But I've always felt like personally, like that it's kind of a hostile word. Um, and I think it's for the, like just tracing this like motif of faith that's been part of all of the presentations. Um, I think it's because of the way that um, care is sort of used as a replacement for love because like love in American culture has this like really ambivalent relationship to like both romantic love on the one hand and then like God's love, which is like both, you know, it's like, it is part of like the founding of the country. It's on the dollar bill, but like as secular like progressives everyone's like I don't know like I don't know about like what like you know like choose your own adventure sort of with like love um but like care has the like kind of scary implication to me sometimes of being more like oh no you got cancer I care <laughs> do you know what I mean and it's like wait wait wait, wait. like how did that happen like <laughs> we 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 like um and so there's like this like, um, so I guess like, I was just like thinking about, um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to like say that, uh, because like, I, um, think that it's like, it's weird, but like, uh, yeah, it's like, oh, it's a, it's a weird thing to have a hang up around because it's like, so like, well, well, well spirited, but I, but I guess like, from like a perspective and like from a from like any kind of marginalized perspective it's like possible it's always it's like all there's like always like a way that like people are like in like get involved but then also like that the language is like can't can't like can't, can be like like despite itself like already presents like create like involves certain structures 
I really want to affirm and underline that. And I just, as, as a part of that shared a scathing rebuke of self-care, which we read together in our class. So I think it's great to push against the concept of care and notice where that makes you feel a little tight. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just seeing all of these comments. They're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder now also if the reason, I mean, my class was part of, you know, one of the projects was doing, um, we all made our own self-care kits that were like based on Sarah Ahmed's Killjoy survival kits. Um, and it was part of a university-wide like care initiative or dialogue on care for the year. But I wonder now the extent to which I use the word care instead of love as part of like like a recourse to the secular in an ostensibly secular classroom. So I'm gonna consider that. I really appreciate that. Cool, yeah. I mean, I think there's so much work on love being done now. I mean, Bell Hooks is all about love as a classic. And um, yeah, I really wanna see Milan's episode about womanist theologians on love. Um, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, there's, you know, there like self-care is, self is such a strange, such a weird concept. I, I'm excited to see that because I do know a um I do know a paper that sort of uh, presents like an indigenous academic like an indigenous academic community, like a few it has like a multiple authors who are like care is a like, self-care is like a radical, radical choice. So I think it I think it's both. Like I'm I'm definitely of the like perspective, like you know, like from like um I'm definitely like a pop like a pop like into pop pop reading critique so um anytime there's like a kind of a reference to the self-help genre I'm like yeah, yeah yeah I'm like I'm cool with I'm cool with that like whole sphere and so that's where like self self-care I'm I, I I like get on board but like I also uh like can't wait to check out the review <laughs> I'm wondering if I can invite Stacy just to speak a little bit about the sort of the pre-digital queer communities around kind of audio, because I just, you know, I found that so amazing to hear about. And I feel like it would really enrich this discussion with this sort of longer history. Sure. I mean, I could share that talk as well, if you want the link to share with people at any point in time. Um, so I, for context, uh, I'm just finishing up my PhD. I'm defending next month. Uh, so my work's slowly getting put into book publication. I'm shopping it around right now. But I study queer feminist sound work. So sound work for me looks at both radio and podcast. So uh, what Milan's talking at uh, about my work is my work around looking at lesbian feminist radio history in Canada, uh, which is the same in the US. We just have different policies. Uh, and looking at how certain community radio groups, lesbian feminist radio collectives, were experimenting with sound um, to create different aesthetics that promoted their activism, um, thinking about sonic space, a lot of the questions we brought up here, I think about place as character and the importance of locality that we've lost when we're talking about uh, what makes podcasting uh, so interesting around communities is there's a lot more conversation around the transnationality of it. Um, but thinking about, for me, radio history brings podcasting also into conversation with tensions around loss of space, right? So queer spaces is we've lost so many queer spaces. And that also has to do with the decentering of community, local community uh, over queer identity instead. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to speak on a lot of that stuff. I don't know. We've got like two minutes. So I don't want to get too far into everything and take up all the space because it's your panel. Um, but yeah, I mean, was there something in particular you wanted me to talk about from my work, Dawn? I think, I mean, you've kind of said a lot of it already, but yeah, the importance of space, you know, radio is something that is both kind of being broadcast widely but then also is geographically specific and um mm -hmm. I think I remember you talking also about the sort of the the exchange of kind of cassette tape recordings as a way of kind of keeping certain 
discussions within a community so they actually don't circulate except from specific people to other people they know are sort of in the same community yeah and politics of safety of radio is huge uh thing that i delve into in my research too that we just don't have with podcasting in the same way because podcasting being digital is inherently tied to surveillance culture in ways that radio is not so um a lot of what I'm thinking about is how can we push back against platform culture and the way that podcasts are circulated to try and uh, rethink who the audience is. And again, this is like, who is, who are our podcasts for and how are they being accessed are two really important questions when we think about like, what is LGBTQ podcasting? But this is great. Um, Kathleen, I'd love to, is your podcast out coming out soon it sounds really cool <laughs> it is uh not yet out uh i've um i'm trying to figure out the best way to release it all so i'm still finishing part three of this four-part series um and at that point i'm thinking about uh you know pitching it and trying to like get it to as many people as i can um yeah but i i would love to say like if all of you are ever interested in doing like a queer podcasting working group together and other people in this room, if people are working on stuff, that would be really great to share audio and give notes to each other. Well, you've set up perfectly the thing that I'm now going to say, which is I've just posted um, a link to a Google form in the chat. Um, it's the suggestion form, the feedback form that you'll already have seen if you've attended other sessions. But, um, you know, so if this discussion has sort of sparked ideas like a queer podcasters group, um, then filling that out either to say like, I want this to exist, or I want to help run this or both. Um, yeah, please, please go and fill that out. Um, it will help us to kind of coordinate people after the event. Um, I also posted a link to my own podcast where uh, the uh, these episodes will be um, on that RSS feed. So well, thank you, everyone. Um, and um, I think let's go back to the gather space if you haven't been there before it's great um and yeah thank you kathleen and edda and everyone for attending yeah thank you everyone thank you